All right, looks like folks are hopping in. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining us from today. All right, we're going to get started in just two seconds. All right, so welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Uh, today, we're very pleased to bring you this month's edition of the 2021 E4C seminar series. Um, if you're new to the series, uh, the series aims to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. We typically host a new research institution monthly or every other month to learn more about their work in advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and global development broadly. Today's seminar will be presented by Dr. Arvind Rahman from the School of Mechanical Engineering Materials Engineering at the College of Engineering at Purdue University. My name is Yana Aranda and I am the president of Engineering for Change and I'll be one of your moderators for today's seminar along with Dr. S. Jesse Austin Brennan. The seminar you're participating in today will be archived on E4C site and of course on our YouTube channel. Both the URLs for those locations are available on the slide you're seeing now. Information on upcoming seminars um, is also available on E4C site, but E4C members will receive invitations to such seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C team at research and engineering for change. Org. We also invite you to share your feedback at the end of the seminar to inform our strategy broadly and the link for the survey uh, is listed on this slide. And if you are joining us today on Twitter, I welcome you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C seminars. Now, as I mentioned, this series is uh, co-moderated and was launched by Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman who leads ASME's Engineering Global Development Research Committee. And you can see a little bit of his incredible pedigree on the slide in front of you now. He is currently an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan, uh, where he applies his really broad perspective to uh, investigating the best ways to incorporate system level interactions between stakeholders in emerging markets into the design decision-making process. All right, so before we move on to our presenter and of course to any questions, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, access to information and digital divides, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, a prior art database of over a thousand central technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about membership. And we also invite you to learn more about our impact uh, by visiting the URL listed on the slide. E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by Engineering for Change research fellows annually on behalf of our partners and sponsors and delivered as digestible reports on our platform with implementable insights. We invite you to visit our research page, the URLs are listed on the slide, to explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review the State of Engineering for Global Development, a compilation of academic programs and institutions offering training and research opportunities in this sector. If you have any research questions that you want to work with us on or research projects that you'd like to pursue as a research fellow, please contact us at researchandengineeringforchange.org. And in addition to that, E4C supports a broader portfolio of engineering global development initiatives at ASME. One such initiative is in fact focused on hardware-led social innovation through ASME's Hardware-Led Social Innovation Accelerator, ISHO. 
Events are happening right now. We've wrapped up our regional events in India and Kenya just this week, but we do have iShare USA coming up in July and you are all very warmly invited to learn more about innovative hardware solutions advancing social and environmental impact from innovators around the world who will be competing for a chance to join the ISHO alumni, uh, ISHO cohort for 2021. So I uh, do invite you to join us. The link is listed on the slide. Registration is entirely free and I assure you it will be time incredibly well spent. So with those introductions, uh, we're eager to know who's on the line with us today and where you are joining us from today and give you a chance to uh, engage and practice your Zoom skills. So uh, we invite you now to go ahead and type in your location into our chat. So welcome, I'll, I'll check it off as well. I'm joining you all from Brooklyn this uh, fine day. Um, we have Indiana and Michigan. A lot of Indiana. I think uh, we pulled in some folks from Purdue, of course. Welcome from Colorado and Kenya. All right. Frankfurt and Atlanta. Welcome, welcome. Great to see you here. Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, it's the first one for me from there. Boston. All right. Welcome, everyone. I keep typing your location. Just as a reminder, we encourage you to type in any remarks, any um, thing that you want to share with your fellow attendees into the chat. We will be taking questions in our Q&A tab, and those will be exclusively for the presenter. We want to encourage you to type those questions there so we don't lose track of them. Um, but moving forward, I think everybody's got a good grip on what Zoom is, having lived a Zoom existence for uh, the, the past uh, year and change with our pandemic uh, affecting the way we work and live. So thank you again for uh, joining us today. It's now my deep pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Arvind Rahman. Uh, just a little bit of background on Arvind. He is the Robert W. Adams Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University. His research focuses on exploiting nonlinear dynamics for innovations in diverse interdisciplinary areas. He is the co-founder of the Shaw Family Global Innovation Lab that supports technology development and translation for sustainable development and he is also the PI of the 70 million USAID funded Laser Pulse Center, which we will be learning about more today jointly. Dr. Rahman secured funding from the NSF, NIH, NASA, NNSA, USAID, philanthropic donors, and several industrial sponsors. He is an ASME fellow, an ASME Gustus Larson Memorial Award recipient, and an NSF career awardee very impressive individual with a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of California at Berkeley, a master's in mechanical engineering from Purdue University, and a BTech in mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. He joined Purdue in 2000 and currently serves as the executive associate dean of the faculty and staff in the College of Engineering. He has also served as associate dean for global engineering programs, leading strategic initiatives for global education, research, and engagement in Latin America, Africa, and East Asia. We are so honored to have Arvind join us today and take time out of his busy day. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen now and Arvind invite you to share your slides for your talk. Over to you. Uh, can you all see this? Okay, uh, well, thank you so much, Yana, for the introduction and to Jesse for, um, you know, inviting me as a part of this E4C um, seminar series. Uh, I'm personally, you know, super excited to see uh, E4C engaging with the uh, global development uh, work coming out of ASME. Uh, what better, uh, what better outcome could a uh, life, I mean, such a long-term ASME member hope for, you know, I, I, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, been a part of ASME for a long time, love international development, and, you know, this is great, right? It's, it's, it's really like a home inside a home for me, so to speak. So really appreciate it. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, I, d I did want to preface, uh, you know, before we get sort of started on this talk, uh, I just wanted to 
uh, point out that, you know, in my previous uh, uh, job before I, you know, uh, started working on laser, uh, very much, you know, my focus was like many people on the call, really on looking at um, engineering innovations, uh, but more innovations of in things in technology based solutions, you know, whether it's biomedical something or if it's a solar and energy related something, you know, of course, always driven by uh, community driven needs scale up, you know, you know, those kind of challenges, but that that version of me uh, 1.0 was really focused on uh, innovation of things. Uh, what this experience at Laser has really uh, brought to my attention is a lot more uh, the realm of um, innovation needed in um, in systems and in services uh, also. And so I think the talk will be potentially slightly different from it's not going to be based on you know design you know for development and so on. It's going to be much more systems engineering of uh, large-scale systems to achieve certain goals. Uh, so with that uh, preface, uh, I wanted to start this off with uh, reminding everyone of a, uh, a brief snapshot. Roughly, this is about a dec uh, about a century of history of international development. It's important to look at the long arc of international development, where it's what we know as international development today, where it starts from and where it's going towards. Um, so this is roughly a century, like I said, and as many of you know, uh, the origins of uh, uh, the conditions that led to the need for international development, you know, pretty much go back to the industrial revolution and colonialism, you know, the two factors coinciding that led to massive inequities uh, in the colonized uh, countries. Uh, and then when that colonial structure started crumbling is when those inequities are really exposed, right? And so uh, what you see is starting from the pre-1940 you know, pre industrial revolution colonialism collapse of uh, colonialism is where the needs really become apparent to the world. Uh, the Second World War in fact is also a really important example of uh, the collapse of that colonial structure. Uh, but it's really important to note that um, initial efforts were much more focused by NGOs. So you know, Catholic Relief Services was actually created uh, about a decade before uh, the, the Second World War began uh, to try and address some of these inequities that are emerging in, uh, in uh, some of the, uh, uh, in the global South, World Vision gets established. But the first uh, example of US government intervention uh, for international de development is uh, arguably the Marshall Plan. Uh, Post-war uh, uh, post reconstruction in Europe, it was seen as being so incredibly successful that right after that, President Truman, shown here in this photo, and his inaugural address in 1949, quickly pivoted the Marshall Plan because post World War II, uh, the the development uh, uh, landscape quickly shifted also to geopolitical rivalry, not unlike today. So it's funny that we are living the same situation today as well. But uh, you know, to the the Cold War had already started uh, after the Second World War. And uh, the US found itself competing uh, basically in the global South as well in many ways. And so uh, the first example of what we would know as a development government funded uh, development program targeting uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, countries in the global South as opposed to Europe is really the 0.4 program that President Truman started in 1949. Um, President Kennedy then established uh, USAID because as these programs were continuing, it became obvious that you need to have uh, you know, permanent offices in the ground and so on. That's where USAID begins. As we go through the 20th century, many colonial structures continue to collapse. The 1960s sees the collapse of uh, you know, the colonial uh, enterprise in Southeast Asia. And really it's from the, uh, I want to say killing fields of Cambodia and Southeast Asia that Mercy Corps emerges from there. Uh, BRAC emerges from the chaos ensuing from Bangladesh's uh, independence. Um, but at the same time, we also see an increase in maternal child health issues, the AIDS epidemic, the global health side sort of picks up a lot significantly here. So you see these NGOs getting started to really implement and the USAID starting to really work with these uh, implementers to implement uh, development programs. 
Gates Foundation, this is where you know, more of the techie side is coming in, Millennium Development Goals. The US Global Development Lab you know, gets set up in 2013, 2014. Uh, that's changed now. It's called the Innovation Technology and Research Hub. Um, and the Sustainable Development Goals, of course, 2015, which uh, laid out uh, the end of extreme poverty by 2030. Uh, by the way, uh, at the rate at which things were going in 2015, uh, this goal seemed uh, very reasonable. Uh, in this situation, we have uh, a monkey wrench thrown in the works called COVID-19, uh, as you all know. And so this picture of a century long growth and trying to target uh, the, the root causes of <clears throat> inequities in the global south then has led to really some new challenges the way I see it. Uh, I think there are three important things that have happened. Um, I think many of you know that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has significantly increased the number of people living in extreme poverty uh, in, in, in the world. I mean, there's significant increase uh, per World Bank estimates. Uh, the World Food Program estimates, at least in the countries where they work in, that the number of people in extreme food insecurity has more than doubled. Uh, global health now is going to remain a major concern, especially in the global south for a very long time. So you look at these three things and you go, oh my goodness, uh, the work that needs to be done in development suddenly got, the lifting got a lot heavier. And it's not that it's gonna be for a year. This will stay for a decade, if not two, uh, to try and iron out all the progress we were making from 2000 to 2015, the Millennium Development Goals, a lot of it has been unraveled. And then all this is of course happening in the context of uh, you know, new geopolitics, new, new geopolitical realities. Uh, so the work has become a lot harder, a lot harder and will for the next decade for international development. Yet the best as we can tell, the budgets for global development, whether they come from the US government, whether they come from philanthropic donors, uh, bilateral donors, as best as we can tell, it's probably not gonna change a whole lot. So all of a sudden, all of us in the development sector are gonna to have to do twice the lifting uh, for the same amount of resources. Uh, so that is a huge challenge, but in challenge lies an opportunity in that one venue to really make sure that development programs, uh, whether it's a, you know, USAID, whether it's uh, the European Union, uh, the Canadian uh, uh, Development Research Corp uh, Council, um, <clears throat> all the bilaterals and also the philanthropic foundations as they do it, they're gonna be pushed to become much more results and cost effective uh, to accomplish larger goals. And you know, I argue that research and evidence-based development is really what's needed uh, to accompany, you know, to be able to accomplish more for less. I mean, that's the way to do it, uh, to be more effective. And that's a place where universities can play a really important role. Uh, so it's really that uh, larger context in the arc of, you know, century of development and looking forward for the next two decades uh, where I see um, in this significantly increased challenging uh, environment for international development that uh, this community, ASME, E4C, and the larger academic research committee can play a really important role. Uh, this transitions me to laser. Um, so laser is pretty much set to, to try and work in this paradigm of how, how can we get uh, research uh, and evidence-based and data-driven um, information to, uh, to really uh, improve development outcomes of you know, major development programs around the world. That's what this is for. So this is in some sense a pilot, which I don't think we had uh, imagined COVID would hit, but uh, the timing is great because we started doing this before COVID. And I think this is going to be at least one of the pillars uh, by which uh, the significant development challenges in the next two decades will actually be accomplished is using integrating research into practice and policy for development. Uh, so briefly about, uh, about uh, LASER, it is a five-year cooperative agreement. We are roughly in, about in the midpoint of a five-year uh, program. We have amazing uh, consortium members. I wanted to highlight who they are. Um, we have the Catholic Relief Services, which is one of the main uh, implementers, one of the top 
let's say five, five, 10 implementers that USAID um, contracts to for implementing programs. Um, so uh, amazing partnership with Catholic Legal Services, which we've been having for a long time uh, that has led to partnerships in many technical sectors and then laser came along and uh, th they've really been a key partner for us to understand how the development business really works from a practitioner's point of view and helping us um, you know shape the interaction with practitioners and those who implement programs uh, development programs uh, you know of USAID and, and more uh, Indiana University uh, University of Notre Dame and between the three of us Purdue Indiana and Notre Dame you know the three finest universities uh, in the great state of Indiana uh, very complementary skills Indiana University tremendous tremendous strengths in policy environment uh, global health um, uh, University of Notre Dame tremendous strengths in monitoring violation and learning and um, in social justice and so on and then we have uh, the star uh, University of Sub-Saharan Africa, at least of Uganda, uh, Makerere University, just an incredible partner who had a lot of experience uh, with a, a prior version of laser used to be called Higher Education Solutions Network 1.0. And they were a prime in that. And so they were a network. And so then in a sense, laser becomes a network of networks because by engaging Makerere University, we're able to really tap into uh, their network of the Resilient Africa Network, it's called, uh, as well as the tremendous experience they've had in implementing consortia networks and development innovation. Uh, so we brought this team together, really fortunate. And uh, uh, I have here, there are many, uh, many people who make laser run. And I can tell you, it's not me who makes laser run. <laughs> many other, everyone else makes laser run. Um, but I have here uh, a snapshot of a few of the individuals, some of the key personnel. Uh, Yuwen Yi, she's a professor in industrial engineering, um, just an outstanding uh, uh, colleague, a co-PI who's helping uh, providing the academic leadership along with me uh, to LASER. Uh, and then we have uh, Pallavi Gupta, the program director, Betty Bugusu, the technical director, uh, Chris Rice uh, at Indiana University, who's really uh, leading the effort at making sure our communication of research, the research products we, we think about and, and we think about how to make sure the research project products have the influence they need to have in order to get the change we seek, uh, then uh, he's leading that effort from Indiana University. Really fortunate to have uh, Alexandra Towns from Catholic Relief Services, who is really uh, taken the lead in thinking through uh, the embedded research translation uh, idea that um, I'll be talking about here in a bit. Um, and Fred Rossi, who is our monitoring evaluation learning specialist uh, you know, at the University of Notre Dame. So all of us are, this is the key personnel within, within LASER. Uh, let me talk briefly uh, about what the charge and scope of LASER is. USAID asked us uh, to be ready to offer um, uh, research uh, assistance and services and award researcher and practitioner teams uh, to be able to address research challenges in every USAID partner country anywhere in the world. And they wanted us to be able to be able to deal with research uh, challenges in any technical sector. And as you can tell, this is a huge challenge. Any regional focus, any technical sector, it's, it's incredible. Uh, so uh, we had to come up with some really interesting innovations to be able to be very adaptive, to be able to deal with this. Um, quick uh, overview of what laser components are. There are five key components of laser. Uh, one is the network. And so we have a registered network of 2,600 plus researchers and practitioners from 61 USAID uh, partner countries. Um, and what's interesting about it is unlike ResearchGate, uh, when you become a member, you actually uh, provide uh, data about yourself based on um, USAID or development sector uh, interest focus. And you know you can also provide uh, examples of the kind of products, research products you've done. So it's a very interesting niche uh, set. If you want to find a researcher with a specific um, interest in a certain country, uh, this is this is turning out to be the place to go for it. Right. So that's a very interesting uh, network and resource we have. A second piece is really um, 
trying to get at the um, uh, you know upstream of what the research needs are. You know, so laser is not laser actually works with our donor USAID entities and other stakeholders to try and get to the basis of well, what is the fundamental place that we need to focus research efforts on, and and of course we then fund them uh, for it. Um, and as we fund them, uh, you know, because this is really about applied research leading to, you know, translation to, pro to, to policy uh, or, or practice, uh, we require in our research funding that implementers, whether they're NGOs, whether they're local government, whoever the partner is, really are integrated from the get-go. And we have a whole um, set of processes that ensures that that leads to really good outputs. Gender mainstreaming is a key. Uh, Part of uh, Laser Pulse, we have um, uh, you know uh, online training. So people who apply for uh, funding from Laser Pulse are required to take uh, our gender mainstreaming uh, uh, yeah, online courses, um, and uh, we we monitor that, we track that, um, and so that's a key, really important thing uh, in what we do. We try to make sure that a uh, in our processes that a lot of our PIs, uh, or we try to make sure that a that there's good gender representation in the PIs uh, that we fund as well around the world. And we have a capacity strengthening piece where we work with um, our awardees and their teams uh, to really strengthen and sustain their capacity for doing this sort of development research and translation for development. Uh, so these are the five main components of laser. Um, we do two kinds of uh, uh, funding um, uh, models. One is what we call core funding where we do these R4D conferences in different parts of the world, the research for development conferences that are followed then by uh, grant rounds in country. Uh, we issue requests for applications and fund them. Uh, what's been interesting here is that we've used our collective as a consortium. We have longstanding international partnerships. So every higher education institution has these partnerships in certain countries. And so we leverage that in a very significant way and that's the reason why, for example, because of Makerere University, well, actually all, all, our, all, the, universe, all, all the institutions in the consortium uh, have an interest in East Africa. So we had an East Africa uh, R4D uh, uh, centering on Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania with the focus on water, food security, and primary education. We issued a R4, RFA, uh, you know, getting researcher, practitioners, implementers together, they have to propose something and we help them along the way. Uh, we did one in Bogota, in Colombia, where the, you know, the themes were the Venezuelan migration response, integrated rural development and youth. Again, this is based on, in case of Purdue, we have a long, long standing partnership in Colombia, so we're able to leverage that. Uh, Indiana University has very long, long standing partnerships in Vietnam and in Ethiopia. And so they helped us really uh, lead uh, our engagement with those countries to come up with a request for applications there. In Vietnam, it's water and air pollution, private sector competitiveness, digital economy. In Ethiopia, it was in youth leadership and development and the measurement of resilience, which is a very interesting topic um, that was proposed. And then Notre Dame helped lead uh, a grand research challenges for development round uh, as well. There is one final round for those interested uh, for requests for applications that we'll be doing uh, out of laser and that's going to target uh, minority serving institutions uh, leading uh, some of these teams to work uh, on critical research challenges um, uh, in the global south. So uh, this is how we do our core funding basically. Um, the other side of uh, the funding model is what we call uh, buy-in uh, funding. And th that is an internal USAID uh, uh, terminology, but what it really refers to is uh, through LASER, we have access to any, um, any part of USAID, any mission bureau uh, uh, institute or office uh, can then fund uh, research uh, through us, that they're interested in certain kinds of research. So they become they themselves are the implementer practitioner and they're seeking direct input into a USAID program uh, in that case. And so in that case, uh, we, uh, we work closely to refine what the research challenges is, find the best research team. Sometimes we do, you know, again, uh, funding calls to try and get the best research teams and help them along the way uh, for effective uh, research translation. Uh, so, <clears throat> 
through the buy-in funded research, we are funding about 14 different programs um, to the tune of, I think more than about $24 million right now. Uh, and the work, the research work uh, spans in about, uh, I wanna say 16, 17 countries where uh, this is going on. I wanted to just highlight two examples of the kind of uh, research uh, we do through uh, buy-in fundings. Uh, one is a cultural restoration program in Northern Iraq where uh, <clears throat> the US government is interested in uh, really looking at um, <clears throat> you know, trying to restore uh, the populations of some of the religious minorities that were uprooted uh, during ISIS's uh, reign of uh, terror uh, in Northern Iraq. And uh, one of the practices that ISIS followed was really to target the, um, uh, some of the religious, some of the um, agricultural underpinnings of the religious uh, uh, practices of those communities. So for example, you know, Yazidis might have then a uh, certain practice with certain, you know, olive uh, or, or olive oils or, you know, or, or, or wine in their ceremonies or something. And then uh, the ISIS, you know, you know, really the campaign targeted, uh, it was agricide in some sense to try and get rid of uh, the, 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 the root of uh, those practices as well. And so, you know, these communities are very dispersed and really to restore uh, these communities, uh, you know, the refugees who have fled elsewhere aren't just going to come back because everything's been destroyed. The very basis of their, uh, their cultural practices has been destroyed. So it requires an initial research where really working with refugee populations to try and identify what were those religious practices and how do they map on to agriculture. So this is really about cultural agriculture. So there's research that needs to be done to identify what those were. And then a second phase of the project, project is really to um, rebuild the capacity for sustaining that agriculture that supported the culture. Uh, and so this is a very significant major program. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, a second program is South Africa uh, Traffic in Person. Very, very important program where we're partnering uh, with uh, the Department of Science and Innovation in South Africa uh, and the USAID mission in South Africa. Uh, and this, when we started this uh, buy-in project, uh, the request came because South Africa at the time was, um, uh, you know, was needing, to, was wanting to highlight its efforts at uh, dealing with human trafficking uh, as a part even of, uh, trying to uh, their membership into the OECD, for example. And so this was one of the key research topics that would help uh, inform those efforts, uh, make them more effective. But the real idea is to uh, uncover through data, what is the scale and scope of human trafficking in South Africa, which by the way, another sad um, uh, outcome, uh, our authors that we, our, our PIs that we fund on this project in South Africa have determined um, that there's been a significant surge in uh, human trafficking uh, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is one more of those, it's, it's, it's a huge surge that has happened. And so it's gonna become, that's one more thing that's gonna become very hard to, um, uh, to manage longer term, but, uh, but this research is going on. It's very important to have uh, research, evidence, data on the scale and scope of human trafficking in South Africa. So we've partnered with uh, DSI and the USAID mission there to do a call for proposal through the South African Academy of Sciences. And uh, we got great teams assembled together that are working to really track this, um, this problem down. So these are examples of a very high impact, you know, use of applied research to inform policy and practice. You can imagine uh, this is big, very big. Uh, <clears throat> so going back to laser components, I want to quick uh, shine some light on the systems engineering that we need to do to put such a, a program together. I'll talk briefly about the identification of research needs and then talk a little more about embedded research translation after that. So identifying research questions, as I mentioned, this is part of the things we do before we issue a, a call for proposals. And just wanted to uh, take you on a journey with me here. Yeah, you know, we go, we decide we want to do a call for proposals in Colombia based on partnerships we have. We know we can quickly bring many you know, universities together to, to be able to do this. 
Uh, so we speak with the mission in Colombia that identify three broad themes in which they would like to see, you know, some research uh, leading to translation to practice and policy. Uh, one is the Venezuelan migration crisis there, another is integrated rural development, the other is youth. And they tell us go. And then we have to figure out, well, what questions should we pose for the research call? How do we figure all that out? I mean, these are huge topics. How do we do this? And so this is where, um, you know, uh, Professor Joe Sinfield, who, uh, who's the director, he's in civil engineering, but he's the director of our innovation and leadership studies program at Purdue, really a uh, visionary and uh, thought leader in the space of, um, uh, you know, innovation science, broadly speaking. And so he and his group have developed something called the Comprehensive Success Factors Analysis, specifically for dealing with gaps uh, in complex development challenges. And uh, so this is a systems level approach that helps identify and isolate really, you know, what are the main gaps that prevent a successful development outcome? Uh, the reason is take any one of these challenges, Venezuelan migration crisis, let's say the development objective in your results framework or theory of change is to have a, a quick and safe um, uh, integration of the refugee population uh, into the host country. Let's say that's the overall goal. It's a hugely complex challenge because there are many, many, many pieces that need to be, in, there's no single silver bullet. There are many, many things that need to be in place for a successful outcome like that. So comprehensive success factors analysis, we'll talk a little bit about it, gets to really looking at these challenges, working with a whole bunch of stakeholders to identify, well, what are those factors on the ground uh, where uh, that are really, there's a big gap uh, in uh, their implementation. And so if we were to do research, we wanna focus our research there on places where the conditions on the ground are really not being met. So the research can help move the needle and have significant impact. I mean, you could do research in any of the different factors that are needed, right? But it's not gonna have the impact. There's only limited resources. So you have to be wise and invest in places where research can move the needle on those places where the, the conditions on the ground are really not being met uh, for some reason. Uh, so the main innovation science idea is that there is actually a method, a systems level analysis method, a systems engineering, if you will, that can identify these missing success factors systematically. And it involves things like mining the published literature. So when it's only migration crisis, you do data mining, text mining, try to identify what are the different uh, factors that need to be in place for it. Uh, construct what are called issue trees after that. Uh, consult with key stakeholders, experts in the field to try and refine those trees. Bring together stakeholders, practitioners, researchers, to try and hash out which of those uh, in those issue trees where the gaps really are. And so it's a very complicated process to really do all this properly. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Joe's uh, research group has determined is that regardless of the uh, development challenge you're looking at, there are roughly a set of 15 primary categories into which these success factors fall. Regardless, you could choose global health, you could choose you know, Venezuelan migration crisis, and you know, it's gonna be this. It's pretty amazing that they've determined this. Uh, and so broadly speaking, they come into what we would call operations bucket, participatory element, systems robustness, foundational elements like security, safety, policy, government leadership, right? And so what they do is, so let's say we have the Venezuelan migration crisis. What they would do is to do a lot of text mining to really understand uh, what are all the different success factors that need to be in place, infrastructure, infrastructure for the intended beneficiaries? What are the different in quote unquote infrastructure elements that need to be in place uh, for a successful outcome? Uh, for those to be in place, what are some uh, uh, prerequisites for those things to happen and how are they connected? You know, is doing one accomplishing another objective? So you create this interconnected trees of issues uh, underlying each of these for let's say the Venezuelan migration crisis uh, effort. And once those trees are constructed, we send them to uh, USAID, to NGO experts who work in these areas who tell us, hey, you're missing this, you're missing this in this tree, you know, you need to consider these things. Then we convene all of them for a research for development workshop, in this case in Colombia, uh, to, really, um, uh, to really hash out the details and based on votes and based on what they're doing to really push up which are the gaps, which are not so much the gaps on the ground. And we really have information on, well, this is what's missing on the ground. And then we, you know, 
publish their RFA uh, in country to ask researchers and practitioners to team together to address those gaps. That's how we do this. And to give you a sense of how one of these programs works, I've got a little video here uh, that uh, Marilyn is going to help me play. It provides both a glimpse of how we are using a pre-existing partnership between, in this case, Purdue and Columbia, and how these R4D sort of hash it all out, uh, you know, workshops work together. So uh, uh, over to you, Marilyn, if you can share that video. It's a quick three-minute video. Yeah. Laser Pulse is another activity that has actually uh, taken advantage of the uh, partnership in Colum Colombia. It's a very unique program and really tries to bring in researchers to engage with uh, uh, practitioners, implementers of development programs. Uh, uh, and so there's been a very big increase in uh, movement across many colleges, across many departments, really academic partnerships uh, that have blossomed. So it's really nice to see this grassroots level impact of the academic partnerships as well as you know the big uh, projects that come through uh, by being top of mind as an academic partner to engage both the Colombian government and the U.S. government in its efforts in Colombia. Uh, the comprehensive success factor process is really anchored in providing a systems view of the complex problems that we find in socio-technical or socio-political contexts. Uh, the core of the process is built on evidence of patterns that we've uncovered that occur in all of these problems, um, no matter where they are in the world, that are anchored really in human behavior and in the context in which these challenges are faced. Uh, we found that there's roughly 15 to 16 major categories of problem areas that typically have to be covered that span from stakeholder engagement and leadership involvement through to resource provision for the actual solution to a problem, ultimately on to the adoption of measures that might be part of the solution, and then techniques that are required for sustainability and resilience of the solution to be lasting uh, over time. Yeah, a key uh, element of these complex problems is that quite often they've been deemed to be intractable. And I think our work uh, with the compre comprehensive success factor analysis demonstrates that they're intractable because they're extremely complicated, uh, which makes it daunting, uh, certainly, but the intent of this process is to raise those variables in the eyes of the people that are working on the problem. You start talking about numbers and you start talking about the real issues and, and the problems behind politics. Uh, people get to understand each other and usually they find out they're closer in their positions than they thought they would be. You know, so we, we had people from the government here, people from the academia and, and from, from uh, implementers, uh, implementer organizations. And even though they have some, some differences in, in how they approach things, once they start talking about the real issues and the real problems, they found common ground. There's been an incredibly diverse uh, group of perspectives that have been incredibly rich in attacking these, these problems that are faced in Colombia right now. And I think that's been one of the major strengths of, of LASER in this event and in the award itself. When we designed the, the LASER award, the achievements that we wanted to have were to create a network of, of researchers that could address a wide variety of development problems, to bring them together and create opportunities and identify the, the major development problems and questions that exist in all, all around the world, and then to fund and to translate the research that can go into these problems and these questions that they were able to identify. Here in this event, it's been a microcosm of all four of those purposes. And that allowed us to, in very quick time, bring together the very best professionals, the experts in these uh, really interesting interdisciplinary areas where you know where research can help in dealing for example with the venezuelan migration crisis where it can help with integrated rural development where where it can help with programs uh, dedicated to youth uh, you know so it's the combination of getting together high trust knowing the system bringing the best people together to get the best results that is going to have the most impact on uh, these populations, vulnerable and uh, you know very poor populations, both in Colombia and across the region. So it's a great win-win uh, program here in Colombia. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay. So let me quick uh, go back and try to wrap up uh, here. Uh, thank you. Um, so. Uh, that's an example of how we identify research needs. And I'll briefly touch upon, I'm conscious of time, you know, how we worry about embedded research translation. 
um, you know, our embedded research translation effort, once we identify the research problems, we do issue an RFA in country, we require research teams to have implementation partners. And once we make these awards, we really accompany them in the journey to make sure that the research and practice are embedded right from the get go, rather than, hey, let's finish the research and then figure out how it translates. And so we call this approach embedded research translation. So laser's definition of it is really that it's an iterative co-design process amongst academics, practitioners, or the stakeholders in which research is intentionally applied to a development challenge. And again, this has been, I want to highlight a lot of the great work that Alex Towns, Laura Rittering at CRS and Chris Rice at IU have done to really think this through and take this generic approach and apply it to all the funded research that laser funds uh, to ensure effective translation uh, to, uh, for development practice. Uh, there are four parts to this. Uh, you know, the process asks for the funded teams to think through what their partnership is, what their process is, what the products of the research are. How do you think about what products you want to go up for to have the impact you seek uh, to the dissemination? Just because you have the products doesn't mean uh, you don't think of how you're going to disseminate it to have the influence on on the policy and, and, and the practice as well. So that's what we call embedded research translation. It's, it's a wonderful effort. Uh, these are the four pillars we have defined. And, um, you know, let me quickly skip through this slide and uh, just want to point out that one of the key things we've done is we've been able to do a systems engineering of the process needed, regardless of what research team is trying to accomplish uh, of guiding researcher practitioners themes through guiding questions. We have many tools available to them uh, that we have designed uh, in Laser Pulse. It's called detailed implementation plans. Uh, so, Arvind, so, so, sorry, so sorry to interrupt. Are, are you intending to share a slide right now? Because so we're not seeing a slide. Oh. You may have paused sharing screen for the video, but. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Let me just. No, uh, no, no worries. I, uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah, just go ahead there. Can you see Thank this now? You. If we can, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we, we, we have developed these tools that really allow researchers, practitioners to, you know, collaborative way, really think through these four pillars from the get-go. Actually, at the, we require them to be thinking of this when they make their, uh, pr propose uh, their research work as well. And uh, we kind of accompany them in the process, make sure they're making a lot of progress. So for example, in the uh, Northern Iraq, uh, you know, buy-in that I told you about, we actually have a strategy workshop with the research teams. This is between Notre Dame, University of Duhok, Indiana University, Stockholm, uh, Peace Research Institute, and USAID, who is really the beneficiary, uh, the translation partner in this case, uh, and go through all these things and they work through all this and they realize, oh yeah, we need to define these details. And it really provides a nice systems level uh, engineering to ensure that people think everything uh, from the partnership, the process, to the translation product? Is it gonna be briefs and reports? What assistance is needed to do? Briefs, technical briefs, uh, et cetera, uh, to training manuals. Uh, and we help them, guide them towards what kinds of products they should be thinking for, for the impact they, they seek to have uh, and how to disseminate them. So it's a very detailed process of embedded research translation and dissemination that we work on. That's one of the key things. Uh, of our embedded research translation uh, processes in laser. Um, and you know, in the end, I want to again highlight some of the overall innovations in the systems engineering of laser that the researcher network, researcher practitioner network we have created uh, based on development research expertise is really unique. It's pretty amazing. Um, comprehensive success factors approach to help upstream, help USAID and other development donors figure out, well, where is the research gap that we need to focus on. Uh, how do we implement an embedded research translation that ensures that most of the research is actually going to be used, uh, there's going to be uptake, and is it, can there be intentionality behind it to make sure that it's taken up? And what we're working on now is really uh, matchmaking algorithms. We've got a marketplace of development researchers around the world. Can we suggest to people, hey, you know, or a donor comes in, you know, uh, make suggestion algorithms, for example, behind this, hey, maybe you want to partner with this person or something like that. So we're working on these systems level issues, but I just want to highlight some of these innovations that are needed to run something like this. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, pause and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, would welcome any questions. Well, thank you very much, Aaron, for that uh, 
both informative and I, and I would say inspiring talk. Um, I think this is a this is a topic that's very close to a lot of the things people have talked about before in our seminars. We've had some systems engineering people discuss, uh, you know, sort of similar thoughts around what are these structural issues? You know, we can focus on the technology. We can focus on sort of these local design development things that we've done before, um, but it's not translating as you've talked about to impact. And so, so really thinking about what does it mean to have impact? What does it mean to be successful? Um, we, we had a, a couple questions and I would encourage people who are on the, on the line here to write either in the q and I'm gonna try and synthesize some of those questions uh, or in the chat where we'll be monitoring that, but please put them in the Q and A so we can, we can ask them to Arvin, make sure we get your questions to him. Um, but I have a lot of questions of my own. So, so I thought, let me start with what's in the Q and A and then I, and then I have some, some questions for you. Um, when one of the questions you have is you talked a lot about, you know, having these sort of larger teams you're working with crs you're looking you're working with catholic relief services you're working with usid you're working with a lot of people where do you focus in terms of building that team you talked about matchmaking at the end there right who are sort of the major types of players that you are focusing on in terms of where the academic researchers fit into this larger picture of contributing to development practice right so you know, who is in that matchmaking algorithm and, and who do you guys at Laser, who do you focus on trying to connect together? Uh, yeah, as I said, the thank you. That's a really good question, Jesse. Uh, we've not yet implemented this, uh, this sort of uh, algorithms yet to, you know, we haven't done it yet, uh, but it's going to be based on research. After all, this is Laser. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, Yuri Nies and her team, uh, Priyanka, they're actually carrying out some very interesting research that uh, tries to identify, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, amongst all the funded research, uh, tries to identify, you know, are there uh, elements that might, you know, provide us some patterns about, you know, what are, you know, uh, can you even predict what would be a successful partnership? Sort of a thing, right? Uh, I mean, you can do a very simple thing. Sim there can be very simple algorithms based on, hey, you know, if you're if you're interested in this region and this uh, development sector, then perhaps these are the people. So that's very simple, like keyword-based matching. Uh, but we're also looking at, you know, are there other ways to do this better? So there's some research going on, and we hope to be able to finish that, wrap it up here uh, in the next few months, and. Um, uh, and use it uh, potentially as a basis for doing recommendation engines. But that's what we're trying to do is a recommendation engine really uh, behind. Uh, but having said that, going back to, you know, are we trying to engineer certain partnerships? No, I mean, we do calls for proposals and, uh, you know, research partners partner up with, uh, you know, implementation partners and do it together. And one of the things we've tried doing recently is uh, in the last round, we actually had the implementation partner and the research partners work through the systems level analysis on their own. Uh, to bef Before you propose what you want to do, walk through this to really be sure, is this really what you want to do? <laughs> is that really the problem or is it something else? You know, So there's been a, another undercurrent in trying to democratize this uh, process of systems level, uh, you know, comprehensive success factors. Uh, and that alone has led to potentially leads to uh, better partnerships, because if you're not able to sort this out, you know, between yourselves, you're probably not going to be able to, you know, apply. Um, so we've tried to keep it self-selection right now. And, uh, you know, at, so the selection stage it becomes apparent, you know, which uh, researcher partner teams are, you know, have it all thought out and those who don't, but we've also now tried to democratize the process. So when they come together, they can work through this, um, you know, maybe to improve the partnership, but we don't recommend, uh, you know, hey, maybe you should work with so-and-so, uh, but on the network moving forward, we will be implementing some sort of a recommendation engine. Uh, so uh, I'll let you know when that's done, uh, but it's a good question. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit just to build on, on, on your response and I'm wondering how you guys, so a lot of the language here is taken from, you know, uh, when you talk about embedded research translation, you're talking about innovation science, 
which is a lot like implementation science in, in ways with different focus, but a lot of the same language. Looking at critical success factors, you have the system, soft systems analysis. Um, and you talk about sort of evidence-based practice, right? So it's sort of like taking this evidence-based practice and then thinking about how do we do that knowledge translation into a particular context, right? Is what is what I was hearing, right? I don't know if that's that's exact. I don't want to speak for you, um, but that's what I was hearing. So I guess one of my questions is when we think about research and we're saying we need to do research, we need to have this sort of evidence that whatever this is works, you know, can potentially be successful when we're trying to translate it or develop that evidence. What, what does that evidence look like to you? Because I'm not sure that we have consensus or maybe, I, I'm, I, let me not say that. Let me ask you, what do you see as like evidence of an evidence-based intervention or innovation for you? Like what is compelling to laser when you're looking to say, is this evidence-based practice that we're trying to develop, right? Like Gates says, you have to do an RCT for certain things, right? Like what is what is it that you guys are looking at as evidence when you're looking at, you know, selecting among these different projects or or thinking about whether something works or not? Um, so we have, you know, how we ended up doing it is uh, we have a peer review process where we have researchers and practitioners, you know, the top who look at the. Uh, the technical merit certainly, but also look at, you know, uh, and we have our own team look at the, evaluate the translation side of it. Are they, have they really thought this through or not? Um, you know, to your point and your question about what we would consider to be, so it becomes, when you see these applications, you, you, you're you able to see clearly how people are collecting the data Many of them are doing quasi-experimental methods, you know, hypothesis-driven research. Um, and so it becomes obvious what, I mean, the applications, the process has to address what is the research, what's the data, what's the evidence, and how are you going to use it uh, for the objective? So that's, it doesn't get past even the first filter if that's not, you know, minimum amount is not there. Um, but in terms of what we look for, uh, that even if people do exactly what they've written in the application, it may still not lead to good outcomes because for us, it is the long-term impact. You know, We do want to be able to say that, hey, this policy brief was a key uh, uh, decision-making uh, you know, in the South African government's approach to dealing with uh, you know, human trafficking. So one of our challenges we face, actually it speaks very much to your point is Tracking, you know, the biggest impacts that happen through any of these programs are never secondary. Sometimes they're tertiary, quartern, you know, quaternary. Yeah, you know, the report finds its way somewhere. Somebody else picks it, and somebody else, you know, conveys it to someone else, and then it appears. It takes a lot of digging to get to that point. Uh, what we do in Laser is we're able to track, uh, you know, outputs. We do secondary. We ask people, hey watch the uptake of those outputs, you know, your video and, and then the rest of it, it disappears. It's very hard and it takes, uh, you know, calling up people, hey, whatever happened of it. Um, so that is still somewhat elusive, but that's what I would consider ultimate impact is, um, you know, the approach is all the projects we know have evidence-based, uh, research-based uh, uh, informed decision-making involved in them, but what difference do they make? What impact do they really make? Uh, that is an ongoing struggle for us, especially within two and a half years. Sometimes the impact might be a little longer, but it is something we don't have fully figured out right yet. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think you were already speaking to my to my next question, which was, how are you guys thinking about impact and measuring it, given the sort of different timescales that you just brought up, right? So um, I get. I guess one of the questions I have as a researcher in, in terms of you guys really have, it, it, it appears to me that you guys have thought a lot about this ecosystem of the researcher, the practitioner, the governments, these bigger systems, these sort of holistic way of, of identifying where are the leverage points that we can actually try and potentially have impact. Um, so, you know, again, as an academic researcher myself, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, like, how do I plug in? I care about these outcomes. I care about having an impact. Where do I plug in to try and 
myself identify these learning structures. You're offering us some tools to do that. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is when we're thinking about that impact or measuring it, and you're talking about, okay, like there's this longer time scale, maybe we have to, you know, call people or figure out how we even see these sort of knock on effects within the system. Um, is there, like within that ecosystem, how do we, how does that align or how do you guys square that with the researcher incentives and, and timelines, I guess, right? So, so my question would be, where do you, to take this to the next level, right? Like if we really wanna make an impact on poverty, right? Or sustainability. How do I, as a researcher, make sure that my work, when I've moved on to my next funding project, that my work is having that impact, that I'm having some feedback loop I can close, right? So, so how have you guys taken that to say, how do we take those lessons and disseminate them back to ourselves, basically? Yeah, no, that's right. a really, really good question. And uh, it also speaks to the scale of with the challenges, you know, uh, the, the, you know, you know, you know, we're funding 25 projects and, you know, within a year or more, we're going to be funding 30, 35, 40 projects, trying across all these researchers and embedded in multiple countries. And uh, it, it, the, the scale, it, you know, at that point is, is, is impossible to deal with to track impact. So our strategy has been twofold. We've had a segmented strategy. One is uh, there's an impact of this overall systems level approach that we're talking about, right? So there are actually the kind of people who are interested in the talk I gave, or you know, will tend to be maybe more, you know, governments uh, and be um, you know other donor agencies and other networks that are interested in this. And so we have an approach, and I was talking to Yana about it just before this. Uh, so in addition to the standard uh, theory of change and results framework, we also have an approach we have taken up, which is called outcome mapping, uh, and outcome mapping. Uh, is an approach where you um, you are tracking, you're identifying from the get-go who are your boundary partners, who you plan to influence, and your boundary partners, and your it's you actually keep an outcome mapping journal, which all of us in the core team are know about, and you know make sure we try to update those things. Hey, I talked to so and so, the network call, they did this, and you know follow up. So we keep journal. We use an outcome mapping journal within our core team that allows us to see how. The overall systems engineering approach that we are, you know, whether it's embedded research translation or uh, success factors, how it's, you know, moving around and having an impact and influence on people. But the funded research itself, it's very hard for us to track. And so our strategy there has been uh, we uh, empower them with the tools to make sure uh, that they're successful from the get go. So all these tools for partnership, for impact. The feedback we've been getting from researchers is, wow, this is really neat. It's a really handy tool. In fact, when I'm going to be dealing with my next industry-based partnership, I'm going to be using this, those tools myself because it just, I mean, it doesn't guarantee because yes, after two years, you'll be doing something else, but it sets the stage for, um, we hope, I don't have evidence for it yet, but it sets the stage for a more effective impact. But in the end of the day, those individual projects uh, it will be hard. Fortunately, in the buy-ins, uh, our main beneficiaries are actually within USAID themselves. So we know which offices to contact, you know, every quarter. Hey, you know, where did that go? How did that get used? Uh, but in many of the other funded projects where it's local, you know, governments and stuff, it may be harder to track the impact. Um, that's, that's the best yeah. we can do. Yeah, no, no, that's really good. Um, okay, so I have one last question that I'm going to hand it over to Yana, right, I believe, in terms of... We are, um, we are little, quite we are over, over to, time. We are over time. time. Uh, uh, I mean, for those who want to stay, we do have unanswered questions in the Q&A, but we are over time. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to questions. If people have some time, I can spend a few more minutes, no problem. Okay, this, let me just ask this last one because I think it's so important. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rephrase it a little bit, but it is in the QA, so we'll get the, the direct one. So it was asking about sort of political differences between the different sort of member states. I mean, you are running sort of something that's funded by USAID, which has its own sort of uh, position and, and within sort of a geopolitical framework. And you brought up politics and, and other stakeholder interests as part of the critical success factors. 
So I would frame this question as, you know, as a researcher, there are ideas in other disciplines around the positionality of the researcher, right? Like who are you as part of this stakeholder system that you yourself are studying, right? So when you go into a community, your identity, facets of your identity or who you are, who your organization you're representing um, of the different stakeholders, the Q&A asked about trust between the different stakeholders and, and partners in the project in terms of different governments or NGOs in different governments. If you're coming in as Catholic Relief Services, depending on the country, maybe that's a different thing. Um, I would really just frame it from the researcher side you know, other disciplines spend a lot of time talking about the positionality of the researcher in terms of how it affects the results. I wonder how you guys think about the positionality of the researcher or any of the other, other stakeholders um, potentially biasing the outcomes or affecting the outcomes in some way. So that, that's, my, that's my question, or uh, not my question, I'm reframing it, but I think it's a great question. That, that's, a, that's a really tough question. Um, and there are actually many layers to the question, but maybe I'll start with the first layer on uh, the uh, positioning of USAID relative to you know country governments, even just within that. Let me just start with that framework. Uh, so, as you as you all probably know, USAID publishes uh, country development strategies every five years uh, for different countries. Uh, so that is basically USAID, the mission's uh, theory of change and results framework uh, for implementing programs. Uh, it, it doesn't come with a budget or appropriations that are not associated with it, but you know, what you're going to be focusing on, why, is all laid out. Those plans, CDCS, are always worked on with the local country government, and they do always end up aligning with elements of the country's development strategy. So that's actually a very high level intergovernmental thing that happens in development of these country development plans uh, that it has to line up otherwise you won't be allowed to operate in country uh, if they don't line up right so so we take the position that hey okay uh, the mission has its own country development strategy which has been worked on with the country government so we're working within a joint framework when you work when you work on a USAID when you submit a peer proposal or something to USAID you're lining up the goals with the missions uh, CDCS, you're effectively lining up with a bilateral agreement on you know, what those development focuses should be. So in principle, there should not be any conflict uh, coming from the identity of one you know, uh, USAID perspective versus local country perspective is really uh, not there. Well, having said that, uh, the other side of it is coming in as a researcher, coming in as a you know, US university researcher, uh, and even in country, the differences are very great. It's true. I mean, you know, there's no doubt that some of these uh, perspectives are. In fact, we have also worried a little bit about, uh, you know, lasers boundary partners don't explicitly include uh, the local communities themselves, right? So they include the implementers, the people who are implementing, whether they're local governments they're implementing programs, and we're getting researchers to partner with those implementers. Uh, but one of the gaps that comes in is, well, what about the communities that the two together are trying to serve? You know, how does that come in? So the, uh, there is no doubt that uh, positioning of, you know, you come in as a researcher, you know, are you influencing the outcomes of the research? Or if it's just researchers and implementers who are doing a program, is it missing, to what extent is it missing the voice of the community? Uh, or are we assuming that the practitioners are so embedded in the community, they know everything about the community? Uh, those are really good questions and we don't have an answer to them right now. It's a really good question, but no answer. All right, well, I think it was something of an answer. I mean, it, it, you know, even bringing it up and discussing it and having sort of those thoughts around, you know, what are we, what have we thought about? Who, what stakeholders do we have sort of agreement on interests with and which ones do we not, right? Um, I think that that's all all very important. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Gianna since we're 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 so far over time. I apologize, <laughs> Anna, but we had so many great questions and answers. No, no, from no. Um, so please go ahead and wrap it up, Arvin. I just want to personally thank you again uh, for your work uh, and time today. So I appreciate it. And uh, Yana, please uh, wrap us up. No, thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you, Arvin. This is such a rich discussion that I think could go on for many hours more, but we certainly won't do that um, as we already had participants uh, head out as we did time, but thank you 
again, for, for the insights, I, I think this is incredibly exciting. And the fact that the answers are not complete yet is just indicative of the work to be done and the necessary work to be done. So with that, I just wanna thank everybody. I'd like to thank our attendees today. Any questions that were not answered, um, you know, we will try to address in some capacity, but um, we encourage you uh, to um, reach out uh, to us, uh, webinars at engineeringforchange.org or research at engineeringforchange.org if you want to continue uh, to dialogue with our presenter and perhaps even raise some questions of your own around research subjects. Um, with that, I wish you all a good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you may be, and I look forward to seeing you on the next B4C seminar. Take care.